Welcome to the Dinosaur George podcast, a show about paleontology and other earth sciences. Dinosaur George is a public speaker, author, and TV host with 30 years of study in paleontology. He has performed live in over 4,500 events across the US and Canada. Now, here is Dinosaur George. Hey, good morning, everybody. It is August the 8th, 2019. I am the Dinosaur George. Do you like the emphasis on the word the? This is episode 144. This one's going to be kind of fun, I think. Um, it it's The subject today is a simplistic explanation of of the evolutionary process. I recently was at a, I did a small museum event at a museum down in Clute, Texas, a place called the Brazosport Museum of Natural History. Really, really cool little museum. You guys would be amazed at that thing. You know, one of the things that amazed me the first time I went there, I've been going there for years, is how many authentic fossils are on exhibit in that museum. It is pretty spectacular. I can tell you, it's a very small museum. Their real focus is on seashells. Uh, and by the way, Clute, Texas is kind of down along the Texas Gulf Coast um, near the town of Lake Jackson, I think is is bigger than Clute, I believe. But anyway, um, mostly what they have in there are seashells. They have a huge collection. I think the biggest collection of seashells, I believe they said west of the Mississippi River. So it's a big collection, but it's the exhibit of fossils that they have and fossil replicas they've got both they've got a complete allosaurus in there which is spectacular so anyway i was down there doing a show and while i was there a young boy came up to me and told me that he didn't understand how evolution works and it was i understood what he's talking about because it is very confusing because evolution you know the actual idea of evolution is an odd thing because there's we can't point to things today to say look that thing is evolving because we don't evolution doesn't occur overnight it's not an immediate thing it takes a long time now sometimes it can be accelerated like during a a say a big environmental change a lot of animals have to adapt relatively quickly and if they don't well then they go extinct so there there's certainly some examples of animals adapting relatively quickly but when i say relatively i mean relative to the age of the earth um this is a long, steady process, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you can look at it and witness it today, even though it's happening around us. Uh, let me give you an, a, for example, uh, give you an, an example. Um, raccoons. All right. Raccoons are animals that shy away from humans. They have want to have nothing to do with us. They're animals that that are completely wild. They're not pets. They're not something, even though they look cute and cuddly. Go over and try to pick one up and you'll find out. Uh, remember the Tasmanian devil cartoon you saw when we were kids and he would go into that look like a tornado with just teeth and hands flying around. That's a raccoon. If you made the mistake of trying to pick one up a wild one. So raccoons are an example of an animal that is slowly evolving to to act and behave differently. Now, it doesn't mean that its body design is changing uh, the evolutionary process can be the evolution of a changing, um, a changing behavior. You can evolve and change your behavior and you don't necessarily have to become some new animal to be, uh, to be affected by evolution. So the evolution of raccoons, at least in the cities, these animals are becoming very, very different. They're behaving very differently. They've recognized humans as an excellent food source they don't need to go out and hunt for their food. They don't need to forage for their food. They found out that if they just show up to the garbage cans before the garbage man gets there, there's a smorgasbord of food available to them. And if this continues, and there's no reason why it won't, if this continues, what we're going to see is we're going to see raccoons. I think some of them will lose their ability to hunt and forage because they have become solely dependent on humans. Some of them are becoming very friendly. And I say that in quotes, 
we have a tendency to apply human traits to animals, and sometimes that's a bad thing to do, especially when it comes to animals like a raccoon, for instance. Um, this is an animal that is not um, a human-friendly animal, but it will behave differently knowing that it's going to get fed. So when you walk on your back porch and there's a raccoon eating out of the cat bowl, that doesn't mean he's your friend. That just means he doesn't see you as a threat. He sees you as a waiter and he's waiting for you to fill the bowl. So here's an example of an animal that is slowly kind of evolving its behavior. Well, I thought today I'd dedicate this show to give you a very simplistic explanation an example of the evolutionary process. And so when I come back, I'm going to take a breather for just a second. When I come back, um, I'm going to kind of give you that whole, uh, that whole explanation. It was the largest predator in North America and known simply as the king. Now you can own fossil replicas from Tyrannosaurus Rex, the king of the dinosaurs. Our online store is filled with T-Rex teeth, claws, skulls, and more. Display them in your room or office, or use them as teaching aids in the classroom. Our prices are affordable, and we don't add excessive shipping fees. They are great gifts for anyone who likes dinosaurs. Go to store.dinosaurgeorge.com to see our wide selection. All right. So the description of the evolutionary process, let me give you a simplistic view. Let's pick an animal that everyone is familiar with. We'll pick dogs. We'll use a dog as dogs as an example. So imagine for a moment, we've got this, this large group of dogs and there are, um, let's say there's four brothers, all males, these brothers, they're all related to each other but they're distinctively different from one another. That's not that unusual. Look at your own families, for instance. You may have siblings that are very distinctively different from you, maybe in height or weight or build or whatever the case may be. So let's say we've got five dogs. Let's say we are living on the island of Madagascar and we we dogs, there's there. I mean, I'm sorry, four of us. There's four dogs. One of these dogs is way faster than the other four real fast this this dog is much faster more athletic next we have one of our brothers who's very small this is a very small little dog doesn't weigh very much then we have the big one the powerful one real powerful dog way stronger than his siblings and then finally we have this long skinny slender one now these four dogs are all related they're they're brothers so they are immediately related they're all dogs they look different but they're related Now, the fastest dog knows that it can outrun and catch things like rabbits. And that is its prime focus. It loves to eat rabbits. So this dog has a high protein diet because he's faster than his brothers. He's capable of catching things that his other brothers are not capable of catching. So this particular dog is very, very fast and a high protein diet kind of fuels that engine and allows this dog to be faster than everyone else. Now, the way animals work is when they have a b- offspring, the offspring are going to inherit traits from the parent. Uh, not always, it's not a duplication, but if you have parents who are tall, more than likely you're going to be tall. If you have parents that are heavy, heavily built, then more likely you are going to be heavily built. So here is our one dog. He's super fast. This dog um, seems to be, well, it, it, since it can catch a wider variety of food, it's doing better than its brothers because it catches a wider variety of food. Next, our little dog, our small one. Now this little guy, it, he can scavenge if he can find leftovers But what this dog figures out is that there is food available to him that his other brothers don't really spend a lot of time on. Let's say it's fruit from a tree. Well, this this little dog has started to develop the ability to eat fruit in its bacteria, in its gut. Let's say bacteria are starting to form that help him digest it. And so he eats more fruit. Now, this little dog is still a dog and he'll eat anything he can catch. But he finds out that eating fruit 
is the best way to go because it's an easy source for him. But he realizes that unless he's under the tree when the fruit falls down, the quality of that food is not very good if it's already hit the ground and is beginning to rot. So this little dog figures out that if he takes a running start and he finds a tree that's not directly horizontal, uh, I mean vertical, he can take a running start and run up into it. Well, by getting up into that tree, this little guy figures out that the fruit that he gets there first is not spoiled and second, he doesn't have to share it. Now we have our third brother. This is the big one, the powerful one. This guy figures out, look, I'm not going to chase my food around. I'm just going to go and I'm going to eat absolutely anything I find who my brothers have killed. I'm going to steal it from them. I'm going to steal it from anybody I find. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use my size to be able to run other animals away from the food they have. And now we've got our slender little guy, the long skinny guy. Looks like a little wiener dog almost. This guy is not fast enough to chase rabbits. His two, his elongated body doesn't really work very well for climbing like his little brother does. He's certainly not big enough to be able to steal food, but he finds out that that long skinny body is perfect for being able to follow a rabbit into the hole. This little guy figures out, hey, I can go in where they take refuge and I can hunt them down. Okay, so we've got four dogs in our in our simplistic explanation of the evolutionary process. Four brothers very distinctly different from themselves. Now, remember I just said that animals will pass down certain traits to their offspring. So again, if you're tall and your parents well if your parents are both tall, chances are you're going to be tall. So what begins to happen is the fast dog is going to have offspring and whoever out of his family is the fastest is going to be the healthiest out of his group and therefore going to be more likely to find a mate who will find him attractive and who will be willing to breed. So if our fast dog has four babies and one of them is much faster than the other three, chances are the super fast one is going to be the one who's going to make it through adulthood and be able to have babies of his own. And he's then going to pass down that fast genetic buildup onto his babies. So what you see happening now is each generation, the fastest of that group is going to have a better opportunity at survival and therefore going to be more likely to reach adulthood and therefore be more likely to find a mate and have babies. And once again, passing off that fast gene, the fastest of the fast in this group is the one that continues to produce uh, new babies. And the fastest of those babies are the ones that continue. So you see what you have is you have a dog that started off being faster than his four brothers. And after several generations, he's not a match for the speed of his great, great grandchildren. They're way faster. Now, as they progress in speed, they change their diet. Rabbits aren't necessary. They're not worth the time to chase. Now you have a dog that is chasing deer or chasing um, uh, baby buffalo, or chasing bigger animals, because if they're going to expend energy to chase an animal, they definitely want to get something in return. And the bigger you are, the more food you have. So here we had a fast brother who has now created an entire lineage, a family of much, much faster dogs. Let's jump down to our little dog, the little tree climbing dog. Same situation. If that dog has babies and one of the babies, let's say, has longer toenails, that baby can get a better grip to be able to climb easily into other trees. He doesn't have to find a tree that's bent over. He can simply run and climb a tree as fast as he can. Now, if your claws are a little longer and let's say your arm strength is a little stronger. Well, if you're one of the kids of this small tree climber. You're going to be the one who climbs the best is the one that has the best chance of survival and therefore passing his genes to the next generation. So we move down the chain about five or six generations and suddenly 
We have very slender, small dogs who have very, very large claws that are capable of climbing up into trees. Now, our bully, the big, powerful dog, all he does is just gets bigger because he knows that becoming giant means he doesn't have to do any of the work. All he has to do is go under the tree where his little ancestors are crawling around up there eating fruit and hoping that they panic and maybe drop what they're eating so he gets to get the leftovers. He's also going to try to follow those fast dogs in an effort to watch them make a kill and then show up and chase them away and take their food. The bigger you are and the stronger you are in that particular family, the more likely you will reproduce and make even bigger, stronger offspring. And finally, we get to our slender guy. Now, with that dog, when it had offspring, the skinniest baby was the one that was capable of going into any burrow. It didn't just mean rabbits anymore. This little guy could chase mice. This little guy could go anywhere. And the long, skinny body allowed it to go have a wider range of diet because it was able to catch more food. So we look fast forward into those generations. Now what's been passed along is the thinner and skinnier you are, the more likely you are to become successful and have babies. So how does this all explain the evolutionary process? Let's start from the beginning again. We've got five dogs, all from the same parent parents living on the Island of Madagascar. Five, I mean five, I keep saying five, four. You've got four babies. Each one was different. Each one used to its advantage whatever its body shape was. And over time, we ended up with four very distinctive different animals than its ancestors. You have these cheetah-like speed dogs. You have these small little dogs that almost resemble squirrels that can climb. You have this great big bully of a monster dog that almost looks like a bear. And then you have this long, skinny, worm-like looking dogs. Now, I'm not there. there, Let me let me say this. This is not a a real scenario where I'm using any animals, because if you're going to go and try to find these four dogs I'm talking about, you're probably not going to find them. You may find animals that will fill that niche. But the point I'm trying to make is that um, you've got. Animals that started out as something that slowly changed and evolved into something different. They remain dogs. They're still dogs. Their skeletal design is a dog. And yet they look completely and absolutely different after numbers of generations. Because one of the ways to evolve is to pass down the gene that is the most successful that ensures your survival. And therefore, that is how animals change and how they evolve. All right. When we come back, I'm going to answer a bunch of questions that I got uh, through our uh, Dinosaur George website on the Ask DG page. So I'll get to that right now. It's time to ask Dinosaur George. In this segment, George answers your questions about paleontology. If you would like to leave a voice message, call us at 210-888-9077. This is not a toll-free call, so children, please ask your parents permission. If you would like to submit your question in writing, go to dinosaurgeorge.com and click the Ask Dinosaur George page. Questions are chosen at random and we clear all messages monthly. So if you have a question about paleontology, ask Dinosaur George. All right, let's go. This is from my buddy Rex from Waco. Hey, DG, I've got two things for you. One is the Paleo Files YouTube channel is up and running. You can search uh, on YouTube for Paleo Files. Uh, my, my buddy Rex has created a... Uh, uh, a YouTube channel uh, dedicated to dinosaur or paleontology. So he just wanted to let me know that that's up and running. Good for you. And he says, too, there is an important reason why I asked this, but I won't spoil the surprise yet. Why is Allosaurus your favorite dino? You know, Rex, the reason why Allosaurus is my favorite and became my favorite when I was probably six or seven years old, one Christmas, I got a bag of dinosaur toys, these figures. And they all looked really cool, but the Allosaurus figure looked completely different. He was much more vicious looking. He 
He had more character to him. The other toys were just a typical static standing on two legs or standing on four legs and not doing much. But this Allosaurus had its mouth open and had its claws kind of spread. And it was sort of in a in an attack pose. So the minute I saw that dinosaur, he became my favorite. Well, as I grew up, because of my falling in love with him from that for, from the first time, as I grew up, I started to study Allosaurus a little more, and that really intrigued me because of all the things I was learning about him. As I got even older and as I learned more about Allosaurus, I learned about a man named Jim Madsen, who was the paleontologist that was working at the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry, where a bunch of Allosaur material was unearthed. I read about Jim Madsen, and he became my hero, and he made me love Allosaurus even more. Then I met Jim and became friends with him and spent a lot of time with him. And I absolutely love that guy. Man, he was such a kind person. He's not with us anymore. But so Allosaurus uh, became my favorite simply because of a toy. But from there, he just remained my favorite because of what it is. I just find him fascinating. All right. Um, oh, and by the way, Rex, just an FYI, uh, my traveling museum is coming to uh, Colleen, which is not too terribly far away from you. My traveling museum will be in Colleen on, I'm opening my calendar, so wait for it, on uh, August 24th and 25th. It will be at the Colleen Convention Center uh, in Colleen, Texas on August 24th, 25th of 2019. And I am going to have my portable podcast unit with me. If any of you are in that part of the state of Texas and you want to come in and sit down and be a part of my show, I would welcome you with open arms. You can come in. I'll have my podcast equipment set up right there and I'll record a podcast. So, Rex, I hope you can make it. All right. Brent from Florida. Hey, DG. If humans lived at the same time as the dinosaurs, which do you think would likely be the dinosaur humans hunted for food? Wow. Also, which do you think would be the greatest threat to human life? Then he puts in parentheses, given varying regions and time periods, let's just reduce it to North America in the mid to late Cretaceous. Wow. Wow, Brent, this is cool. Okay. First, who would we hunt? You know, my initial thought would be the hadrosaurs because there's a lot of meat and they don't really have the weaponry, but they could probably they could probably give a pretty strong fight. We may want to stay away from them. You know what I think would be the, the animal and chylosaurs. And I only say that because they're certainly not speedy animals and their weaponry is designed. Their defensive weapons are designed for bigger animals. A human sized animal, I think would have an opportunity to look for chinks in the armor and kill one of those guys with less with less chance of being destroyed and killed yourself, we wouldn't mess with the horned animals. And again, I think the duck bills may be difficult. We're not going to catch the ornithomimids. We're not going to catch them. Um, yeah. You know what? I think ankylosaurs. And I know some people are screaming, oh my gosh, they're so well protected. Yes, you're right. They are very well protected. But again, um, since they don't have weaponry, that's really offensive their weapons are defensive their weaponry is designed to protect them like a suit of armor but with like a human in a suit of armor if you just run up behind him and knock him down you've already got an advantage it doesn't matter what his weapons are he's not going to chase you down he's not going to run run after you and chase after you so that would be my best guess uh brent this is a very interesting yeah, very interesting question. And then your second question, who do you think would be the greatest threat to human life? That would be the raptors. I don't even hesitate with that. Any raptor, Deinonychus, Velociraptor, Utah raptor, any of the raptors. Um, well, here in North America, Dromaeosaurus, not Velociraptor. Any of the raptors would have been a great threat to humans because we would be the right size to be eaten. They would They would be worth their time to attack us. If they do live and hunt in groups, which I believe they did, that would have made them even worse. And certainly they probably could outswim us and they might even be able to outclimb us, the smaller ones. So 
I would think Raptors would be the worst. Of course, if you're going to talk about the late Cretaceous, uh, you know, Tyrannosaurus Rex is a monstrosity. So is Albertosaurus and Displetosaurus, all of those guys. But, you know, running through a dense forest, those guys can't follow you. There's nothing they can do. They can't chase you down. And they're probably not going to spend a lot of energy. It, that would be like an adult chasing around a mouse all day long in a field hoping to catch it. Even if you catch it, you got a mouse. So I don't, I would exclude the big carnivores and I would absolutely look at the raptors as being the biggest threat. Brent, thank you so much. Uh, hope everything is well in Florida. Love your, uh, love your state. All right. Henry from Texas. Uh, how much food can an Allosaurus eat in a day? Wow. That's a great question, Henry. How much food could an Allosaurus eat in a day? You know, the amount of intake is determined by your metabolism when you're talking about days. Like, for instance, an anaconda can eat a pig and not have to eat again for, you know, another five months, maybe a year. So the question would be, how much could they eat in a day? Well, they could eat 500 pounds in a day, but only one day and then nothing for the rest of the year. With Allosaurus, uh, he's certainly burning through calories faster than a snake. And so Allosaurus would need to eat more often, but let's say he's going to gorge himself and he's just not going to do anything but eat as much as he can in one day. Let's say he finds a sauropod. Well, he's, he's found the buffet table. Based on the size of the rib cage and the estimated size of the stomach, my best guess would be that it could probably eat about 400 pounds of meat in a day. Now that doesn't mean he could eat that much every day. Cause he would certainly take some time for that to, to digest. But I'm just going to say, Henry, that for him, we're going to say 400 pounds would be my best guess. All right. Henry also said, what was the first movie you made? Well, the very first video that I ever made was called dinosaur George's guide to prehistoric life. This was probably about 12, maybe 15 years ago. No, gosh, I bet it's longer than that. No, maybe so. About 10 to 12, no, 12, 15 years ago, I guess. Something like that. That was the first DVD I ever made. I think you can still find it in libraries. It's not in print anymore, but, but um, that was my first movie. And then uh, this looks like from Henry's uh, mom or dad. Henry really enjoyed seeing you at Our Lady of Perpetual Health. Um, or was it Our Lady of Perpetual Health? It was a, a summer camp I went to. I just remember she just used or he just used the letters O L P H, but I can't remember if it's hope. Maybe it's Perpetual Hope. Um, what, I, sorry to butcher that, but anyway, uh, I went there as a summer camp. He said we have watched the DVD he bought about five times in one day. Ah, oh, that's so cool, Henry. Thank you very much. The DVD you bought was either my guide to t-rex guide to allosaurus or guide to triceratops and i'm glad you enjoyed it i'm glad you watched it and i hope you learned something and since your question was about allosaurus then i'm going to assume that what you bought was my guide to allosaurus henry that is very very kind of you to write i'm glad you liked the movie and please tell your parent whoever wrote for you or wrote or made the attachment tell them i said hello all right jeffrey from fremont california hello dinosaur george how could the short-faced bear go extinct if they were omnivores? Wouldn't their prey still be alive today? Oh, what a great question, Jeffrey. The extinction of an animal is not always linked directly to its food source. That's not always. It certainly has a lot to do with it. But the extinction of an animal can be so many other things, Jeffrey. It can be disease, a disease that only affects that species. And that happens a lot in nature. It can be being out, uh, outgunned by newer, more advanced predators. It can be climate. It can be that, let's say, let's say that the short-faced bear um, hibernated three months out of the year. And let's say that the weather changed and winter stayed around another two weeks on average longer than before. And so our short-faced bear emerges from hibernation and it's got two more weeks of nothing but dense snow. It's expending a lot of its energy looking for food that doesn't exist yet. Had it emerged when uh, fall or, or um, 
uh, spring was coming on and there was a ready food source, that would be fine. But emerging when there's not a ready food source means you're burning off calories that you cannot replace. And by not being able to replace the calories, you already make yourself success, successable. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I can't say this word. Succept. <laughs> You're more likely to get a disease. <laughs> Good grief, man. Okay, it's early. Uh, susceptible. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. He held up a sign in front of me that said sus- susceptible. Wow. Okay. So the, just a slight change in the environment means you're more likely to get disease. Um, you're less likely to survive those two weeks. Well, if that happens over and over and over again with these animals and they don't have the ability to adapt, that can cause the extinction of that one species. And yet other animals living with it don't have the same problems. Those are ways that one can go extinct. So even though your food source is there, Jeffrey, it doesn't always mean that it gives you the ability to survive. All right, Gabriel from Ohio. Do you think Smilodons and American lions were dominant over dire wolves? Man, you guys have a lot of cool questions. This is cool. Yes, I do. I do think Smilodon and the American lions would have been alpha predators And the dire wolves would have been in line directly below them. But dire wolves have that one thing that makes them very effective. And that is their ability to hunt together in a pack. So whether or not Smilodons or the American lions were able to maintain that dominance over generation after generation, I don't know the answer to that, Gabriel. You know, as as I, I in the first part of my show, I described how animals evolve wolves dire wolves may have been evolving because you look today uh neither smilodon or the big american lion survived in north america but the wolves did so at some point in time dire wolves or their their immediate ancestors clearly survived beyond the age of smilodon and the american lion so i would say that during the majority of their existence because of their size and the fact that cats are pretty smart too I believe that they would have been dominant, but probably would have yielded to big groups of dire wolves. And there's no evidence to support that American lions and Smilodons hunted in groups. Uh, But there is good evidence to support dire wolves do uh, because of the accumulation of fossils found in a given area. doesn't always mean that they died at the same time and they were living together, but it's a good suggestion. And then looking at um, looking at wolves today, they are pack hunting animals, and that's something that was probably passed down through the generations. So, yeah, for a while, Gabriel, I think they did, but over time, clearly the wolves per- continued on, and that would have made them dominant at some point in time. All right, Johnny from Finland. Hey, remember me? Yes, Johnny, I do remember you you because you're one of you're one of the few people i hear from finland all the time three questions johnny says do you think concavenator has been misrepresented or misinterpreted or just deformed so concavenator with that funky looking thing on his back i don't think that's a deformation i think that it served a purpose i think that the latest image of what it looks like is probably accurate based on what i know about the discovery He also says, I read that the snout horn of Ornitholestes was proven to be incorrect. And no matter how I look at it, a hump on the back of of concavenator just doesn't look natural to me. Okay, so with Ornitholestes, this is a dinosaur that had been that they thought they had a blade like appendage on his nose, sort of like a ceratosaurus. And Johnny's saying that it's been proven to be incorrect. I am unaware of that, Johnny. So I cannot voice Either way, I don't know if that if the original image is correct or the, there's a new version because I don't know about that. I haven't heard. But I will say that your point is well taken, and that is sometimes we look at animals with minimal evidence and make and hypothesize about what it looks like only to find out later on we were completely wrong. A perfect example of that is Dinochirus. Could not have been more wrong with Dinochirus. But my understanding of Concavenator is that there was a lot of evidence, Johnny, to support that it did have that hump. 
All right, second question. When we talk about cannibal dinosaurs, names like Majungasaurus and Coelophysis pop up first. Uh, but was cannibalism, has cannibalism appeared in any other dinosaurs like T-Rex? Yes, it has. Yes, there is a lot of evidence that Tyrannosaurus, Tyrannosaurus rex in particular, hunted and ate other Tyrannosaurus rexes. There's a lot of evidence that demonstrates cannibalism. And so if it's if if we see it in Majungasaurus and we see it in Coelophysis and we see it in Tyrannosaurus rex, then my opinion would be every theropod probably preyed off of members of its own family if it needed to or if the opportunity emerged. And then Johnny says, lastly, what do you think of Lysowicia? I personally never could think that Dicynodons could grow in the size of an elephant. Lysowicia is a, is a big Dicynodon, big dude, man, like the size of a car. Dicynodonts are in, interesting animals because they're sort of mammal-like looking things. They look like they should fit in the family of mammals, but I don't believe they fit in mammals. I think they're a branch. I think they're a branch off. Um but yeah, who would have thought that the majority of that family, most of them are pretty docile looking, little furry furball looking things. And then you have this truck sized member of that family. It just goes to show you, Johnny, that any opportunity that animals have to fill a niche, a void in the ecosystem, one of them's going to figure out a way to do it. And remember at the very start of my show, how one of our four brothers became really, really big well, in the case of this guy, maybe that's an example of this is an offspring from further down in the generational track of of um, him growing up to be gigantic because his parents and his grandparents and his great grandparents were big. And he's big for a reason, and that's to fill an opportunity. All right, Zane from Bristol, Indiana. Hi, it, hi, DG. It's been a while. I have two questions for you. The first is, how fast do you think dinosaurs grew before they attained full size? Ooh, ooh. It all depends on the dinosaur, Zane. Each one is distinctively different. I read where uh, I think Tyrannosaurus rexes reached adult size by about the age of 18. They never stopped growing, but they had a growth spurt that got big and then once they hit that about that age then their body slowed down i would think all dinosaurs probably did that there was probably a growth spurt that happened very quickly because you lived in a very tough environment where you needed to be able to be able to to survive among a lot of carnivores and so my guess is that by the age of maybe 10 between the age of 10 or maybe younger maybe 8 to 8 to 18 maybe most of these animals have reached their adult sizes. They continue to grow. Now, I exclude the sauropods. They're simply too big to have those dramatic growth spurts. They're, they couldn't eat enough food to maintain the growth, like to shoot up to adult size in that amount of time. It may have taken them 20 or 30 years to reach their huge sizes. Uh, but again, that's simply a guess. I don't have any... I don't have any um, uh, I don't have any access to anything in particular to give you a more scientific answer other than my guess. He says, I'm making a Jurassic Park fan, fil fan film and I need information from a great source. Well, that's very kind of you. I wish I could be a better source for that, but that's my best guess. All right, Zane, second question is, have you ever thought about starting a Kickstarter to help gain funds to make a second season of Jurassic Fight Club? Thank you for your time and have a great day. Thank you, Zane, for being so polite. I hope you have a great day as well. No, you know, Zane, I, I enjoyed Jurassic Fight Club, but I I'll say this. If it would have been the show I wanted to make, it would have been considerably different. Um, when you're working for a television network, they're the ones that tell you what to do. In some cases, they even try to tell you what to say. And that was kind of a point of contention. If I ever made a dinosaur-related show... I would want to do a show that involves more field stuff, not just showing images of people digging, but but really being out in the field with these people on the front line, showing you how they dig and then bringing these animals back to life for the best way we know how, but also making it fun. And I would really like to make a television show that involves the public through social media, not just writing in 
but coming on and being part of the show. I think that would be so much fun. But, you know, maybe one day when my, uh, when my, uh, schedule slows down a bit zane maybe i'll do that that sounds like a kind of cool idea and maybe i'll try to do that one of these days all right john from iowa hey dg hope you're doing well and that you have a speedy recover well thank you john i go in tomorrow for my surgery by the way uh they're going to remove my right kidney so i go in tomorrow to do that and so thank you i do hope i have a speedy recovery as well because i want to be able to chase around the cute nurses once i get in that hospital oh yeah baby I'm going to make sure to recover as quickly as possible. And if I catch one of them, I'm going to go, hey, blame John in Iowa for this lady because he wished me a speedy recovery. (laughs) All right. My questions are on sarcosuchus and their behavior towards other animals and others of their own kind as well. Also, is it possible that today's crocs have learned their traits of behavior from them? Well, yes, John, of course. Uh, Absolutely. That's a good point. Again, animals pass down not only their traits, but also behaviors, the way they behave, hunting methods. You know, you don't see a female alligator sitting her kids down on the bank of the river and saying, now watch me, I'm going to sink under this water and I'm going to wait right here. And when something approaches, I'm going to jump out. They don't have to say that because that is something that has been passed down through generations. They know how to do that. A baby skunk knows how to start spraying even before he has any of the little chemicals to do it. You just get a little puff of air, just a little. It is the funniest thing on earth. They don't stink yet when they're infants, but they already know. Nobody told them how to do it. There's nothing in there, and they're still trying to squeeze it out on you. So there is a learned behavior that is passed down from generations. So when you talk about uh, their behavior towards other animals, my thing would be look at modern saltwater crocodiles and that may give you insight into how this giant animal behaved. You just size it up. So if it is, if, if a modern saltwater croc is, is waiting by the bank to ambush some unsuspecting kangaroo that comes up to get a drink, well then just make that saltwater croc five times bigger and make the kangaroo into the size of a, of a, uh, let's say uh, an iguanodon. And there you have it. So I believe that they would have acted the same way that modern alligators and crocodiles do today. And when your question pinpointed, how did it behave with its own kind? I think exactly the way they do today. If you're small and I'm hungry, you're lunch. And I believe he would have acted just like that. So thank you so much, John, for writing. All right, Nick from California. Hello, George. My name is Nick, and I've always been into the outdoors and walking on mountain trails with my family. Good for you, Nick. I'm glad you're getting out of the house and and, and appreciating nature. We all need to get outside more. There's such an amazing world going on out there. Don't waste all of your life sitting inside. Get out there, even if it's in your own backyard. If you live in the middle of a busy city, then go on an animal hunt. Turn over rocks, look under leaves. There's things everywhere. Okay. He said, but whenever I'm in the mountains, it gets me thinking about how many species of dinosaurs or other prehistoric life that must have lived in high altitudes that haven't and possibly may never be discovered. What is your thoughts on the life that could have lived at higher altitudes? Also, do you have any plans to bring your dinosaur exhibit to Southern California anytime soon? If not, that's okay. Keep up the good work, Nick. Thank you, my friend. That's so kind of you. All right, to your last question, Nick. No, I don't have anything scheduled now. I do know that there was somebody, I want to say somebody out in the California area that wrote to us once, but I don't know whatever came of that. But they were wanting to wanting to bring me out there to do something, I think, for a library. But anyway, if anything comes up, I'll certainly mention it and you'll see it on my website. Now, to your point about the animals that lived in the upper upper altitudes, to become a fossil, you've almost always got to be buried in some sort of sediment. You're more likely to be buried in sediment if you live in the lowland areas that are subjected to flooding. Because flooding, you the chances of being caught in a flood and drowning and being buried immediately are good. Flooding also is a great way to cover over the body of something that had died months before. And the silt and the dirt being carried in the flood waters will ultimately accumulate over the body. 
So that's the place you want to be to become a fossil. If you live in the upland areas and in the mountainous regions, your chances of being buried are very slight, very, very slight. Even if it's raining in the mountains, that water's running off the mountain so fast, it's not going to bury you. You may go tumbling down a while, you know, down down the side of the hill, but the water is not going to bury you because the water's simply moving too fast. When it's in a lowland area, the water begins to back up and makes almost a lake-like environment. That's how you become buried. So to your point, Nick, if you lived in the upland areas, the chances of you being fossilized are greatly diminished and therefore... We know practically nothing about some of those animals. Who knows what would have lived? In, think of the odd dinosaurs that could have lived in mountainous regions. How weird could they have looked? It's an unfortunate thing that we may never know. But I'll tell you something, Nick. If we ever find some of them, what a, what a cool thing I think they're going to look like. All right, Patrick from Madison, Wisconsin. Would Triceratops have looped horns like a modern day bovides or would triceratops sharpen their horns on trees like modern day rhinos? Thank you for answering this question and have a great day. Well, okay. Um, their horns, their, their horns are covered with keratin. So keratin is like our fingernails, same thing that covers the claws of animals like cats and cats and bears and lions are constantly raking their claws against trees to be able to keep them sharp and honed triceratops may have done the same kind of thing with its horns you know rubbing them on a tree to keep them uh maybe that that kept them polished animals like cows no let me let me go back and rethink this my family has raised cows our entire lives i do not remember a single time where i ever saw a cow ever saw a cow rubbing their horns on anything. I don't think I've ever seen an antelope. Now I see, we see uh, bucks, male deer do that, but they're not, I don't think they're sharpening the horns. They only do that to rub the velvet off of their horns, but their horns are different from the horn of a triceratops. They're only rubbing those horns to get the velvet that, that covering off of them. So, but that's not, they're not sharpening those horns. That is to get the velvet off. So I'm going to go back and say, no, I don't believe that Triceratops would have sharpened its horns. I think they would have stayed that way natural through the growth of the keratin. So I'm changing my mind right in the middle of my sentence, Mr. Patrick. I don't believe they did that. Um, It's an interesting question, though. It's kind of cool question, but I I don't think they would have done that. All right. Craig from California. Uh, I tell you guys what, I'm going to take just a brief time out. I'm going to grab me a drink. Uh, So I'm going to just play a little short commercial real quick. And then uh, uh, when I come back, I'll finish a few more. Hang in with me. Bring Dinosaur Georgia's traveling exhibit to your school, museum, or city. This is the largest exhibit of its kind in North America and will turn any facility into a natural history museum. You'll see things like prehistoric mammals, giant fish, ancient reptiles, and of course, dinosaurs. It's affordable, amazing, and will be an event you'll never forget. See complete details at dinosaurgeorge.com or call us toll free, 888-487-7478. Bring Dinosaur George's Traveling Museum to your community today. All right, so we'll finish with this. This is Craig from California. Said, hey, Mr. DG, big fan. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate it. Do you think that the similarities in the top jaw notch notch of spinosaurids like Baryonyx and early ceratosaurids like Dilophosaurus is an example of convergent evolution? If so, could the known diet of Baryonyx shed light on the feeding behaviors of Dilophosaurus? What a great question, man. Okay, for those of you that may not know, if you look at a picture of Dilophosaurus or Spinosaurus, you'll see that it's got that funky notch at the end of its snout. It's, it's between the maxilla and the premaxilla. It's a, it's a, it's a hook. Uh, modern crocodiles, some crocodilians have that same feature. It's the weirdest thing. And so... What what Craig's question is, is does that then mean that Dilophosaurus and Spinosaurus are an example of convergent evolution? Convergent evolution is where two different animals evolve similar features that are often used to help them feed or survive. So, for instance, 
uh, Brachiosaurus and giraffe. These two distinctively different animals separated by a tremendous amount of time, both evolved that long neck as a way to reach trees. So now convergent often means that they're living together at the same time, but I'm using giraffe and Brachiosaurus because it's the most visual thing I can think of off the top of my head. Two distinctively different animals that both have similarities because those similarities allow it to survive or make it more likely that it survives in its environment. So was that hooked nose of Spinosaurus and Baryonyx and Suchomimus, those guys, did Dilophosaurus develop the same thing for the same reason? You know, I one time read, um, or read, I one time had an opportunity to sit with Dr. Robert Bacher. He and I were in Pennsylvania looking at a baby T-Rex skeleton of all things. And we had an early morning where we got to go sit out by this fish pond and we talked for almost two hours. Best. Oh, it was great. And we talked about Dilophosaurus and he always felt that Dilophosaurus was aquatic. He felt that Dilophosaurus was an aquatic and not, not fully aquatic, but he was talking about that. And that was, that was 15 years ago. He was talking about them being more aquatic. Well, if in fact that notched nose is, is effective for crocodiles and it's affected for Spinosaurids because we know based on evidence that Spinosaurus ate fish. If we find that in association with that hooked beak, then it would perhaps add credibility to Dilophosaurus being a fish eater. Maybe that hooked beak. And also one other one, you know, who else shares that is Dimetrodon. Dimetrodon shares that hooked beak. And now more evidence is suggesting he was semi-aquatic. So, All of those things together would lend me to believe, Craig, that yes, Dilophosaurus is probably feeding like Baryonyx and like Spinosaur. They are eating fish. All right, John from Iowa. Hey, DG, I'm a longtime listener and a big fan, big time fan. Hey, good, man. He says, I have two questions about Sarcosuchus. The first is how big did they get? Um, Wow, you guys are you guys are hitting the hitting the home run with all these aquatic dudes this time. Um. How big did Sarcosuchus get? I don't know, John. I've seen, excuse me, I've seen so many estimates that range that are off by 10, 12, 13 feet at a time. I just don't know what the what the most accepted size is. I know he's big and maybe is it is it 40 feet, 42 feet, something like that is the last thing I read or saw. I don't know, man, but I know he's big. Second question is, Did they feed on young Spinosaurids? John, I think they would have fed on absolutely anything that walked into the water. I think they would have taken on practically anything. But I believe that they were specialized, I think, in order to hunt. They probably had to sit in relatively deep water, deep enough to hide their body. In the hopes that dinosaurs wandered out into the water to drink. A lot of animals don't like to drink from the shore. They like to walk out into the water. Cows, bovines, a lot of those animals do that. Water buffalo. They don't just want to get a drink from the shore. They want to walk out into the water that's up to their chest. So I suspect that big crocodilian-like animals like Sarcosuchus would have behaved the exact same way. I think they would have waited in deeper water. And that meant that they're eating bigger animals because... The, the small ones wouldn't have been able to go out in deep enough water to where Sarcosuchus could have hit his body. So I think they're actually specialized in eating adult animals, but they absolutely would have. All right, Dino Geek from Calcutta, Indian. Hello, Mr. Blasting. Hope you are good in good health. Well, thank you, my friend Dino Geek. And how are things in Calcutta, India? I would love to come visit one day. He said, I would like to know if Megalodon can exceed 60 feet in length. My next question is, who would win in a fight between Megalodon and Leviathan? Uh, Both of these titanic apex predators swam in the same waters at the same time and hunted the same food. And so fights would have definitely broken out. Okay, Uh, I agree. Okay, first of all, can they exceed 60 feet in length? One of the benefits of being in the water is that the water supports your mass and it means you can grow much bigger than land animals. Terrestrial animals have limitations to how big they grow. Aquatic animals don't. What I believe is that we keep finding meg teeth and some of them are getting bigger and bigger. Six inches, I think maybe seven. I don't even know if they go that big, but I know they get close. 
But remember, the teeth that we are finding that we have access to, most of us have access to, are the teeth from the shark that would have been in relatively shallower water, meaning it wasn't the biggest of the sharks. It's just those that were capable of living in this particular area that is now land, you know, Florida, North, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, places like that. The ocean, the deepest part of the ocean wasn't even near where we're finding these meg teeth. So could there have been much bigger megs out there? I believe there were. I think they were. And I think their only limitation to size was their food source. And if blue whales are exceeding 70, 80, 90 feet in length, then I think it's certainly possible that megalodons could have done the same. Um, And now as for who would win in a fight between megalodon and that giant whale, that leviathan, um, Megalodon has an advantage as, as in that he doesn't have to come up for air. He never, ever has to call off the fight to come up for air. That gives him a distinct advantage because the minute you're running out of air and you've got to break for the surface, that means you're no longer in a position to defend yourself. That means your tail and your flukes are wide open for attack. And that gives the shark the opportunity to, to go in and attack you without you having the ability to defend yourself. So in the event that those two animals met and they decided it was going to be you or me, I would lend my, I would lend my vote to Meg being the survivor. All right. Two more. This is Reed from Minnesota. Hey DG, is it impossible? Is it impossible to determine if two dinosaurs that looked extremely similar are like that because of convergent evolution or divergent evolution, such as the debate with T-Rex and Tarbosaurus. Wow. Man, you guys must have all got together and said, let's come up with the coolest questions this time. Okay, convergent evolution is the evolution of two animals, different, like I just explained, uh, two animals that show up looking similar but are distinctively different animals. Divergent evolution can be You have animals that are branching off of another one and slowly changing into something else. So T-Rex and Tarbosaurus, these two dinosaurs are closely enough related to both be Tyrannosaurus. In fact, I think Tarbosaurus' name was or was going to be changed to Tyrannosaurus Batar, I believe. I believe that's the case. Um, it, It depends. But there are ways to see that very quickly in the fossil record read, and that would be at its skeletal design. If you have two animals, and we'll go back to my giraffe and my brachiosaurus analogy, distinctively different skeletons. You can look and go, these animals have nothing to do with each other. They got a long neck. That's it. But with animals that have devolved from other animals, they're still going to carry enough of the characteristics for you to be able to say that animal is related to this animal. So looks can be deceiving but once you get in there and start looking at the skeletal design then read you're able to determine which of the two would be the case and finally dave from missouri who do you think would win between an acrocanthosaurus and a spinosaurus since acrocanthosaurus might have had a stronger bite than spinosaurus did and was perhaps the more heavyweight of the two but yet spinosaurus was a lot more advanced since it evolved quite a ways later um wow p.s hope you're well well dave thank you very much for that i appreciate that very much okay so you take two animals from two different time periods and you throw them together and you go have at it well the only thing you can do in a situation like that is make your best guess and i try to make my best guesses in these who would win what fights i try to make them I try to base them off of as much science as I can or as much fact as I can. So I start off by looking at the skeletal design. Yes, Acrocanthosaurus was a more heavily built dinosaur. Spinosaurus has a dramatic um, uh, advantage in size. That long snout of Spinosaurus may not have been able to apply the same bite force as the, the more robust skull of Acrocanthosaurus, but that's still an incredibly dangerous weapon. Man, if these two animals met, boy, this is a tough one. You gave me a hard one. Yikes. I don't know. I can't say with absolute certainty who would win. I just, I just can't say. It. I just don't know. I don't know who would who would be the winner in these two. But if I had to choose, I guess I'm going to choose Acrocanthosaurus solely based on the fact that he is from texas 
Boy, how's that for science? All right, listen, you guys, I hope you've enjoyed this one. Make sure to follow me on social media. Go to my Dinosaur George Facebook page and follow me there. You'll find that that's where all of the science is posted. Um, If you've got pictures of some of your fossils you'd like to send, I'd be glad to post them on there and show them off for you. Um, Also, um, connect with me through uh, Twitter, through Dinosaur George on my Twitter page. All of our connections are on my Dinosaur George page, dinosaurgeorge.com. You'll see all of our links to social media there. In the meantime, make sure to take care of yourself. Make sure to take care of the people around you. Be kind to each other. We've had a lot of bad things happening in our country over this last week, and it's easy to believe that the world is is horrible, but it's not. It's not. Don't let the ignorance of a few affect you because the good are always the many in society and there's a lot of good people. And just by listening to this podcast, that makes you a good person. (laughs) Take care, everybody. I hope you all uh, have a great, uh, have a great upcoming weekend and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to The Dinosaur George Show. Please follow us on our social media links and join our mailing list. If you're interested in having Dinosaur George speak at your event, please visit our website at dinosaurgeorge.com. Until next time, keep digging for clues about the past.